But hey, let's, uh, let's dive into Exodus 2, okay? Um, as I was uh, thinking about what I was going to teach on when I got back, um, one of the things that I, I, I'm reading through all these sections and uh, definitely in Genesis and Exodus and really like deep, deep studying. Well, that's what I'm doing. I'm just really trying to get a really good, because I've read the New Testament a bunch of times and I love it. And I've read the Old Testament a few times and I just wanted to challenge myself. I'm going to read the Old Testament and study it like crazy. So that's what I've been doing. And one of the things that I have seen um, is that there is little sections of scripture in Exodus. Because what you think of when you what you think of Gen- Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, what you think of these big, long, elaborate stories is typically what you think of. Because there's chapters of following the life of Joseph and following the life of Abraham and and his family. And so it's kind of like you think of these big blocks of scripture, but then there's these little pieces of scripture that are kind of in between the big stories that kind of get thrown, not, they don't get thrown out there because yeah, definitely people are reading the Bible and they're studying it, but we remember the big stories of the big characters, right? We don't remember the little things. And um, so I, when I was praying and I was kind of reading back through some of the stuff I was reading and trying to figure out what does God want me to teach on, I saw um, this little nugget of scripture that I thought was so cool. But not only did I think it was cool, it actually got way cooler as I was really studying it. And that's what's really fun about the scriptures is there's so much depth in them. You know, and so um, what we're going to do is we're going to just touch on three verses. Okay, it's going to be Exodus two twenty three to twenty five. Um, I'll read it and then we'll pray. Um, it says, "During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God." And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Let's pray. Lord, there's something really powerful about your word, and every time I dive into it, um, I just don't want to stop, because there's so much depth in it, God, and, um, you know, it says um, in this Bible, it says that Jesus, you are the light. And that says that you are actually the word incarnate. And so I just pray, Lord, that you will be the lamp into our feet and that you will truly be the word incarnate today. You'll speak to us. We love you. Amen. All right, so I'm going to just kind of pick this thing apart a little bit, okay? I'm using the ESV version, so it might be a little bit different from whatever you're using, but if you have a phone and that's what you're using it for, go to ESV. And uh, anyway, there we go. So it says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died. Okay, so I'm going to just jump right into those many days, these words. Okay, so... One thing is we think this time period was 40 years. And the reason why we think this time period is 40 years is because Moses was 40 when he ran away from Egypt, when he killed the man, okay? So I guess a little backstory really fast is at the beginning of this chapter, basically Moses, um, he grows to be a man and he um, is under the, the, the house of Pharaoh and basically he sees... Um, a fellow uh, Israelite, I guess, um, Hebrew, get um, beaten and, oh man, I thought I turned off the texts. Sorry, guys. Okay. And, um, and so, yeah, he, he ended up killing a man. And it says specifically that he looks around and he tries to see if there's anybody that saw him and they didn't, he didn't see anybody. And then he kills this man. And, um, and what was interesting, this is not even my message, but I think it's really cool, is, uh, well, it's not cool, it's sad, but he, he, what he did after that is he didn't actually feel ashamed at first. He didn't feel ashamed until a fellow other Hebrews actually said that they saw him, okay? 
And you know, there's actually discrepancy. We're not really sure if he actually was seen or actually if God just revealed it to the Hebrews that it happened, okay? So that's something very interesting. Um, and so he felt bad afterwards. That's really interesting because I think um, that's kind of what happens with us. Typically when we do something bad, we feel way worse when we are found out, right? So um, this is just like Moses. Moses did this too. So what he did is he ran. He ran out. And so basically he is now where he is. And what this, what's taking, or this, the, it's taking place, um, actually while he's gone. So this is how we know that it was 40 years. It's because Moses was 40 when he ran away from Egypt. And in Exodus 7:7, 7, 7, it says Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83. And it wasn't too far after what we're talking about when he goes off and does what he does in 7. So that's kind of how we know. So there's a 40-year period of time. So another thing that we know about this time is that... Um, is that there is a pharaoh change, okay, which is why it says the king of Egypt died. And so um, it's this time where they have this hope. They have this hope that there's going to be a big change. And so that's kind of what this is. They, they have a hope in this, this new king or this new pharaoh. And so we're uncertain at first that the cries that they're crying out are actually for... Um, actually crying out to Pharaoh saying, please save us, stop doing this, or if they're really cries to God. And of course, we see a little bit later on in the scripture that it is more specifically to God. But what, there's some really cool things about this. So I wanted to point out with those many days in those 40 years, one thing, God waited to speak and call Moses out for a long period of time. It took him 40 years, okay, for God to actually speak to him from when he sinned and ran away and when he actually was told by the burning bush, which is literally the next verse or the next chapter at least. He's going to talk about the burning bush. So um, that's a long time, right? When we sin and we feel really, really bad about it and we go to God, um, what's really cool is that because we have this direct access with Jesus... We get to speak to him and say, I'm sorry right away. And we get to have that reconciliation of communication and love from Jesus right away, right? And um, what's, what is more clear in the Old Testament is that they could speak to God. They could pray to God. Of course, God, you could always pray to God. But ever since Adam and Eve and the fall of man, there hasn't been a direct access to God. And so you just kind of waited until God spoke to you until you, you know, the next thing would happen. And so there was, there's this idea where it took him a long time. And so then it says, Moses had done a brutal sin. And the thing is, is these are the things that he needed to do in these 40 years, okay? One, he needed to reconcile internally what he did, okay? So this is something we can apply to ourselves. We... Um, when we do something, it's actually best that we don't just say, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, because I don't know about you guys, but like in, in like my marriage, you know, if I do something, if I'm really, really rude, and I'm like, I say something really mean to my wife, first of all, I don't typically catch it right away, and so we let it kind of I realize after a little bit, after how she acts afterwards, that I said something mean, okay? But on top of it, um, I'm not right away sorry about what I said, actually. I'm actually pretty proud of what I said because I decided to say it. I obviously thought about, or men tend to not think very much, actually, right before they speak, but, you know... We, I said something, and I'm pretty firm in what I said, even if it's going to be mean or rude, right? But later on, I realize, obviously, after either her telling me, typically, I have to actually go to a, you know, I'm not saying I go to a secret place or a you know, private place. I just kind of live out the rest of the day going, why did I say that? And I start trying to reconcile, why did I do that? And then I realize, okay, because I'm sinful and I'm messed up and I'm mad at this and I'm this and it's all this stuff that I've had holding into me. Typically, you don't say something mean unless they've actually, 
you know, there's a, a bunch of things that have happened, you know, to make you do this. So anyway, this can work with any sin you do, literally. Um, you have to walk away and you have to reconcile, and I use that word very, and it's a very important word in my opinion. You have to reconcile internally what you did, just like he did. He had murder, he had an act of passion, a lack of self-control. So I put act of passion and self-control next to murder because I don't think any of you guys have murdered, right? But I know all of you guys have had an act of passion or you've had a lack of self-control. And so this happens all the time for us. And when we have a lack of self-control, we don't typically realize we did it right away. Even if somebody tells us, we have to reconcile it. We have to actually go through it in our brain and go, what happened? How did this happen? So Moses is off doing that in this time. Number two, mourn the loss of his family. So these are, this is another thing that he had to do. And, and I, obviously, I'm reading into this a little bit because these are the realities that he had to do, that any human has to do. Um, he has to mourn the loss of his family. So think of that. Who was his family? He actually is confused on what his family is, A. B, his family that he thought he was protecting actually is the one who is going to tell, basically tell everybody about his murder. But then the family that he actually grew up in, uh, he's actually going to lose, or he did lose when he ran away, because it says a little bit later on uh, that Pharaoh's actually ticked off at him and mad, and it's a big deal. It actually, actually not later on, it says before that, that he's, that Pharaoh is mad and that he almost has a chip on his shoulder and he actually treats Israel even worse than they were before because of what Moses did. Okay, so he now has to mourn the loss of people he loves. Um, he no longer is part of that family. So I don't know about you guys, but if you guys have ever mourned a loss, um, it's not easy. And I've not only mourned losses of somebody who's died in my family, but I've mourned loss of relationships that I've had. Um, and not necessarily in my family, but good friends where some kind of issue happened. Uh, here's a good example. I used this one earlier when I was uh, telling somebody something. Um, I had a buddy that we did a lot of music together, and we were in the music industry together, and we were in Christian music industry, so it was, you know, we were, we thought we were doing things for the Lord, which we were, you know. We were a little selfish, maybe, but we were doing things for the Lord. And, um, and he loves Jesus with all of his heart, and I do too. And God's starting to show me and start to share with me that, that for me, being in the music industry at that time in my life was not good, and I needed to consider going and being a missionary, okay? And so I decided to make the move to Italy. And when I did that, I had to obviously tell my friend that we were doing this together. We were in contracts together. We were in everything, okay? So this was a, like a legit thing. This was what, wasn't just a guy that I fist bumped, okay? This was like a, a real, like, I guess, so to speak, a corporate relationship, maybe, Okay? And I had to share that with him. And it was one of those things where God was saying, like, if you want to have life, you need to take up your cross and follow me right now. I would need you to go and do this. And so, um, and it was for my own protection and my own family's protection at the time. And so I decided we were going to go to Italy and we went to Italy. And so um, I left him high and dry, basically is my point. He ended up walking away and we didn't talk for almost three or four years, you know. And it wasn't until this last year when we reconciled. But those the last three or four years, one of the things that was so hard was that I actually, he was like one of my closest friends. And it was a really hard relationship to lose. And so they're actually, I think mourning a loss of somebody dying is really hard, but I actually think, uh, and this is just my opinion talking here, but in my experience, mourning a loss of a real relationship can be even worse than losing somebody to death. Especially if the person who dies is a Christian, you know where they're going. Of course, 
if they're not a Christian and you don't know where they're going or you absolutely know where they're going and it's not the right place, that can be really hard and I totally understand that. But I will say that relationship and a loss, I know uh, there's actually a few people here at the church um, and my wife actually has this um, in common with them. When we decided to actually get into ministry for the first time, um, she has, my wife has family members that are, um, they are, uh, well, one of them is an atheist, another one is a Jehovah's Witness, and you know, you just go down the list. They do not agree with what we're doing. They don't even understand what we're doing. And so in a lot of ways, um, she had to kind of lose and mourn the loss of her family. So um, I, I say that to say, that this was a big deal. That was my point. It's like Moses just destroyed his life. You don't destroy your life any more than killing your, your own kind and then also causing your father, basically, and your whole family to hate you. Yeah, I mean, that just kind of you don't ruin your, fam- your life any worse than that. And so he runs away. And it takes 40 years for God to speak to him. So he's really lonely. That's all I'm going to say. Super lonely. In that time, of course, we see that we find out that he actually had a family and all that kind of stuff. So maybe he wasn't as lonely, but he's missing out on on his family and everything that he knew before. Okay, so this is a big deal. Number three, during this time also... Um, he needed to prepare for what he would have to do, which is not just he's mourning the loss of his family, but guess what he's now going to have to do, which he doesn't necessarily know he's going to do this yet, but God is preparing, letting him have the time to prepare for this. He's, he's going to have to take that, and he's going to have to go and be against his family head on for the sake of the people that think that he is the worst because he killed somebody. Like, think of the, the depth and the, the um, general hospital vibe this gives, okay? This is a very deep uh, thing that happens, and it stinks. So, anyway, um, next, these are the lines. Uh, the, the, the next part, it says... Uh, during many days, or during those many days, the king of Egypt died. Now, king of Egypt died. Uh, it says, very specifically, it talks about how this, this guy is the guy who hated, um, was, was basically the father figure, okay, of Moses. Um, and I think actually more technically a grandpa figure, not a, not a dad figure, but anyway, um, somebody very important in his life, and he dies, and so now there's this kind of hope that there would be something else that would happen, another king would come, and maybe these Israelites would be able to be free, right, um, from, from the slavery that they're in. And so um, there's a couple things I wrote down about this. The Israelites had to live in hostility for 40 years longer with, with a Pharaoh that hated them because of what Moses did. This was an additional motivation to the original fear of the Israelites growing in number and potential power. So before this part of scripture, there's a part where it talks about the, um, where the reason why originally that Pharaoh was actually, um, getting afraid of the Israelites is because they were growing in number and they were growing in power, okay? So this is actually before Moses was born. And so what I wanted to point out about that is that Pharaoh had a fear that Israelites were going to actually destroy all of Egypt. And why did he have that fear? And this is something to think about in this story is actually the Israelites never showed their power, never showed their numbers. They never, like, it it wasn't like a a huge revolt that happened, okay? No, the only reason why he feared it is because he knew that it was God's people and God's people was growing in number. And it does very specifically say in Exodus 1, 9, it says, And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. And what I find very interesting is that mighty 
is a word that unless somebody shows their might, you wouldn't know that they're mighty, okay? And that's something that is big because obviously he saw their might through the God that they served, okay? So that, I think, is really cool and applicable to even us as Christians now. Um, uh, but we'll get there in a second. So the man who would eventually save them caused more pain and hostility at first. So that's Moses. And then, um, so like I said, this can be, this story can actually be a, 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 a parallel to Jesus dying for our sins and giving us a great gift that would prove to be difficult and cause persecution until one day Jesus will return to save us. So I want to talk about Moses. Moses going away, him causing more strife to the Israelites because he killed a man and then he goes away, and during that 40 years, there's all this strife and even worse hostility than there was before, okay? I want you to think of this parallel that happens. Jesus doesn't necessarily kill a man. He gets killed himself, okay? But Jesus creates this way for us to be saved, which then would actually cause the world to actually hate us. It says very clearly, um, let's see, where did I have it written down? I do have it written down. Uh, well, anyway, I guess I don't have it written down. But um, it is the scripture where it talks about that we're going to be persecuted, okay? That we will be persecuted just like him. And so in a lot of ways, this is a similar parallel to what's happening. And a lot of people can use this scripture as another point to the gospel and to what Jesus did on the cross is what happened. What happens is he actually, he dies on the cross. He creates the church, okay? And now the church is going to be persecuted as we are out there walking and we're out there doing what God's called us to do. And one day Jesus will come back and he will save us. And there's going to be a long period of time that, that happens in between that time. And that's what's happening with Moses. And so they're, they're, they are definitely making a parallel to even what Jesus is going to do. Um, and then it says, The potential power the Israelites had was never fully realized or utilized, like I said. And we can be feared and oppressed by the secular world without ever being hostile towards them because of God's hands in our lives. So that's a big deal, right? Like our hand, like people see God in our life. And that is another reason why people persecute. That's another reason why um, what's happening is God is showing his might through his church and people re realize it and recognize it. And that is a lot of reason why we have the persecution that we have today. Uh, the next verse, it says, uh, the, the people of Israel groaned and because of their slavery and cried out for help. So, um, the Israelites had hoped that the new king would show mercy and be different because he didn't have the same chip on his shoulder before. So I want to make a parallel to what we do as Americans a lot, okay? We actually believe that the next president is going to make a big difference for us as Christians, okay? It's one thing, well, yeah, whatever your political opinions are, I don't care and I don't want to hear about it, okay? And you won't hear about mine either, honestly. But what I will say is that none of these political powers that we could have voted for this last time was really going to benefit our Christian walk or was really going to give us better opportunities to be Christian. There's going, it's, it's literally... That is not the power that we need, but it's the power of God, right? It's, and um, I wrote down this. This is such an de in-depth message. I had to write down a lot of things. I couldn't wing any of this stuff. Not that I wing anything, but anyway. <laughs> I couldn't remember everything, so I wrote a lot, a lot down. Um, so we also put too much, like I said, too much hope in the next ruler. As we see in the rest of the story of Moses and Israel, and even the rest of the Old Testament, 
God is the only king they ever needed. See, there's something cool about the, the Old Testament is from this point on, they thought, okay, at this point they thought, okay, the next king was going to be better and it was going to help us, okay? So then Moses, let's just skip all this story. Moses comes, saves them, gets them out, and they, of course they go wander forever and then they eventually are able to enter into the promised land and all that kind of stuff. And of course there's a lot of verses before all that. But anyway, I skipped really fast. We get to that point. And then they start growing restless and they're failing all the time. So then they ask for, then they get judges, okay? And then they beg for kings, okay? They're always looking for something. I mean, actually, one of the best ones is while they're wandering, um, they actually uh, ask Moses to go up and go speak to God and go, you know, basically gets a word from the Lord. And while they're gone, they create a golden calf. Why? Because they need something to allow to be their king, their ruler, their, their God, right? This happens through the whole Old Testament. It, it, it's like they're always trying to find one. And it's just another common thing that we even have a problem with too. I'm not just saying as Americans, I think all around the world, we put too much emphasis in the powers of the world and we're not putting enough emphasis in the fact that God is the one is our king we can't allow anybody else to be a king and we do all of the time we really do um, and you can see it you just go on Facebook and you will see how everybody is going to argue about why one thing is better than the other and blah 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 and it's like you know God doesn't want us to just argue a bunch. He wants us to do something about it. And that he gave us the ability to do that through his Holy Spirit. And it might seem like we can do very little, but if we all do our part a little, man, life, like the world's going to change. I mean, it really will. Um, so yeah, God is the only king that they have ever needed and that we've ever needed. And things only get better when we let go of more of what we have and what we hold dear and let God be the ruler of those things and of our lives. And that's, that's a huge principle we can get from that section. Um, the next part says, uh, Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Cried out for help. So there's something really cool about this before I really dive into this specific part. I really like how there's a process here. And I don't know if anybody gets, like, I know some people would get it, but it's a really cool way that the, the word was written here. They cried out for help. Then it says their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And then God heard it. And then God remembered. God saw and then God knew, okay? That's a really cool, there's a lot of theology in all of that right there. Like, first of all, I'm sure I'm gonna say this later on, I'm kind of skipping, but I want you guys to see that our prayers matter, okay? Their cries matter. Like, when you are crying out for help and you're asking God, it matters. It's not that God didn't know before, because it says that God knew, but it actually, God saw because of their cries. You know, there's this reality that God actually does care about when we talk to him and when we're crying out for help and when we're, you know, praising him, when we're worshiping him, like we were singing stuff today, like God cares about this stuff. This matters in, in this whole idea, this whole big deal of being a Christian. We have to be talking to God. It matters, it makes a big difference. Um, so the people grew, uh, groaned. The Israelites had hoped, oh no, sorry, cried out for help. Their cry for rescue came up to God. Okay, so this is, one commentary said that it, it can be translated actually as exceeding bitter, let's see, exceeding bitter cries. It's kind of a weird way to say it. But anyway, exceeding bitter cries. And the reason why the word bitter is there is because they're really trying to point out that these cries were not 
They weren't, in a lot of ways, they weren't, please help me, okay? But they were more like, this really sucks. Please help me. And I really hate this. Why would you do this? I mean, there's like this idea where it's actually a really bad. That's what the word groan, okay? Why groan is a big word in, in this, in this uh, scripture is because groaning is, I don't know if anybody, if you were to come up to me and groan, would I think that there's, I just think that there's something negative behind that, okay? You're just like unhappy about something. There's like a discontentment in whatever you're doing. And so I think when people are actually really, really, really struggling, they struggle, and I'm talking like, I'm talking like slavery in different countries and stuff. Their cries for help are going to be desperate cries, okay? And it does talk about how when they cried out for help that that was more of like a desperate cry. But later on it says that God heard their groanings. And so there was also this idea of that there was a bitter groan, that there was, they were really discontent about their situation. And what I think, why that applies to us is because I think when we're crying out for help and we're dealing with issues and all that kind of stuff, um, there are some times where we are really, like, I hate to say innocent about it, but we, I don't know. I feel like my cries for help sometimes are a cry after I've already tried to process it myself, and I actually just realize I, dis, I get discontent. I try to figure out all my own problems, how to fix my problems, and a lot of the time my cry for help is after I failed at trying to fix all of my own problems. And so in a lot of ways, this scripture is them thinking that actually a king is going to be the thing that will fix their problems, and so then it becomes discontentment that actually happens. And so, but what's really great, because we know at the end of the story that God cared and he listened, even though you whine and you cry and you have a pity party with yourself, God still cares, okay? So I just think that that's very interesting that they were whiners, you know? They weren't just in pain and hating and, and, and hurting, but they were actually just whiners as well. And actually, we see through the whole story of them going out in the, in the wilderness, um, wandering, is that all they are is a big whiners. You know, they're just whining all the time. That's what they're doing. And so, if any of you guys have kids, that's where they get it from. So, um, so yeah, bitter cries. These cries were not just cries from a chosen people. So, this is another thing to, to, to point out is these were cries just like the marginalized, the people in bondage, forced to work, starved often to death, like those given very little for their, um, let's see, oh, from their government other than the ghettos to live in. Their cries were like orphans. Their cries were like the poor we see in modern days, okay? These cries are not just from people who know God, because actually a lot of the Israelites, even though they might have been following religion and all that kind of stuff, just like we see Christians today, um, or we would actually look at Mormons and go, Jack Mormons, like they are, they, they say they're Mormon, but they really aren't. We have Jack Christians, okay? We don't call them Jack Christians, but we do. And, you know, they're... I couldn't say that there's a percentage of this, but I think that there is a fairly big percentage of those that actually show up on Sunday morning that are actually maybe, I just said actually maybe, Jack Christians, okay? And, um, you know, I guess in some ways, think about that for yourself. Are you a Jack Christian? I think if you came through the snow and sleet uh, on a Wednesday night, you probably aren't a Jack Christian, but challenge yourself on that. Um, so, but these are actually people, so these aren't just people who are following God to the T and perfect, because I just said that they're whiners and they're discontent and blah, 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 okay? These are cries from just exactly the same thing that we see around the world right now. And I would even say in America, and this might actually be really hard for us to hear, but America is not innocent 
in creating these, okay? We create these. And so in our own history, the type of bondage that America has brought on to people that God actually wants to hear cries from and does hear cries from, think about Native Americans. Native Americans, they were literally exact, just think of the Israel story and then think of Native Americans. They were given a lot of land, a place for them to live, but it wasn't actually their own. They didn't own it really. America owns America. And actually what's funny about America is if you've ever traveled around the world, you say America and they'll almost always correct you and say, no, you're United States. You're not American, by the way. We actually have, Americans have actually claimed all of America. In our brains, we have claimed the name America, even though Canada is American, Mexico's American, all of Central America is American, and all of South America is American. But we expect them to call themselves South American. But we call ourselves American. We own America. Okay, anyway. That just kind of shows to you kind of the kind of people we are. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm proud to be an American. I'm not going to sing the song for you, but I'm proud to be an American. I've lived in other countries, and I've seen what it's like to live in other countries. America is a great country to live in, even though we have horrible politics half the time. And, you know, it's awesome. Okay, we have a great country, but we have created the marginalized and we've created people in bondage. Like, and I'll just go down the list. I won't even jump into it too much, but Native Americans and reservations, we put them there and obviously killed a lot of them. Okay, that was bad. That's a big deal, right? Um, so in this part of the story right now, we're actually Egyptians and we're actually, you know, like that. Okay, the Chinese opium underground, okay, I don't know if you guys know this, but I grew up in Tacoma, and we actually have an underground Tacoma that a lot of people don't know about, and that's where all the Chinese lived during the Chinese opium underground thing that happened. They were smuggled into America, and they basically brought opium with them, and their whole thing was is that they were spiritual, and that they were, and people would go underground, and they would do the opium thing, and but they could never come up to the surface and blah, 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 and so they died. And so anyway, that's pretty, anybody knew your history? We have that even in the Northwest. Uh, African slaves, we obviously know that that's a very clear thing in our head because we, we hear about all of the different political things that that kind of creates in our world now, but African slaves. Uh, Japanese imprison, imprisonments, um, when the whole Japanese war thing happened uh, and you know we were dealing with all of that. Um, there were Japanese that lived in America for a very long time actually before that and um, had nothing to do with you know, Pearl Harbor had nothing to do with any of that. And instantly what we did is we imprisoned them. We did a bunch of horrible things to them. It, they would even say there were certain parts of America where they actually put Japanese in a camp, very similar to like a camp in Germany for Jews. Now, I, I don't know if we were as brutal to them, of course, but anyway, reality. Um, also, here's a very modern one and it's been one for a long time, is sex slavery, right? Okay, sex slavery is a big deal. And, uh, and it is alive, like all powerful, probably the, the most powerful place for sex slavery actually is in America. A lot of people think, oh, we need to go to Thailand, or we need to go there, we need to go here, go there. Actually, um, they say, well, we just heard something huge in the news, right? Uh, Kraft, what's his name, Robert Kraft. He just, you know, whatever did what he did, and that was a, a result of sex slavery. It's everywhere, and it's in the worst, it's, in, it's not, it's really in high numbers right now in America. So that's happening, okay? And then we even have the Mexican immigration and workers, okay? Um, and like I said, none of these are actually my political opinion. This just exists. There are farms out there that have illegal Mexican immigrants working for a fraction of the cost, and that is, in a way, very similar to what we see in this Egyptian and Israelite um, kind of transaction happening. These people are paid, but they're paid very little, 
and they don't have a place to live, and they're not legal, and all that kind of stuff. It's exactly the same, right? I prayed a lot before I w w came to do this message, by the way, because some of this stuff is not very fun to talk about. Um, and then, of course, we see modern orphans, and we see foster care, and we see homelessness. Um, and everybody has their opinions on why somebody is homeless or um, why somebody um, would be put in sex slave. I've actually heard, and it's the br most brutal thing I have ever heard from somebody, but I heard, and I like this guy. I'm not going to say that I respect him all that much. I actually respect him less now, but he would actually circular reason why actually the sex slaves, uh, some of these sex slaves, it's okay that it happened to them because of their decisions of life that they made and blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, it's the most ridiculous thing. And there are people that think that. There are people that think. And so I say that to say is a lot of people, because I know, a, a, I'm not going to say a lot of you guys, because that's just too finger pointing, okay? But we have our opinions on why homeless people are homeless. And I know why, I, I know that you guys do, and this is why, and I do too. Because when I drive by them, I don't give them money. Not all the time, I might give them money sometimes, I might take them out to dinner. I actually, one time I tried to take somebody out to lunch, it was actually at a mall, it wasn't here, it was another place, and I was at a mall, and the guy was begging right in front of the mall, and I, I was walking out with my family, and I said, hey, Leanne, uh, Leanne's my wife, why don't you go and, um, go get the kids ice cream, and um, I'm going to go and talk to this guy and go take him inside. And so I asked him, I said, hey, um, do you want to come and have lunch with me? And he's like, well, um, yeah, I don't, really, I don't really want lunch. And I says, well, your sign says you're hungry. He's like, oh, yeah, well, I, I, just, I just need money so that when I am hungry. I was like, oh, okay. Well, um, you know, do you need a bigger coat? It's kind of cold. I... I want to offer to take you in, get to know you a little bit, and buy you food or buy whatever. And after a little bit, he started kind of warming up to the idea of going in. And so we started walking towards the entrance, and then he starts freaking out at me and starts yelling at me, why won't you just give me money? And of course, I had to just be done with that at that point. But that's what gives me my opinion on that. But see, this is the thing, is God doesn't care about that. He doesn't care why they're in the situation that they're in. Because I'll tell you what, he didn't care why I was in the situation I was in when I came to him and I said, Jesus, I need your help. I need to be saved. He didn't care how I got myself in the situation. He just cares that I'm actually realizing it and coming to him. Okay, And so this is just something I feel like is very important about this scripture is that these cries are not just the cries of people who love God because we can easily just account it as a story that we read in the Bible. Oh, this is just part of the story of God becoming or God becoming the savior for the Israel, you know, the Israelites and getting them out of Egypt and all that stuff. And it's all part of the process. But actually, these are real people that we see every day. And you, I just want to replace now Moses as the one that God called to go and do this thing. I want to replace that. As you fast forward, we're going to replace it. And it, eventually you replace it with Jesus becomes the Savior for all mankind. And he says that he wants to set the captives free. Okay, what is he saying? He wants to set not just the captives of our sin, because it's easy for us to just say, oh, well, um, we need to help people get out of drugs, or we need to help people get out of the captivity of their own self, which I'll tell you what, most of us need that, and I think all of us need that to some degree. But, God, but Jesus is actually physically talking about captives as well, because he then says, orphans, and he says, we need to feed. Uh, let's see if I can. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. This is Jesus quoting is, um, Isaiah. Um, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. First thing he does is to the people, to, to real people, to the poor. 
Sure, we can say the poor in spirit, and we can easily put that in there, but it's the poor. And it says, He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind. Okay? Sure, we can say, oh, this is captivity of spiritual oppression or of secularism or whatever, another religion. Sure, we can say that, but he's actually talking about real people too. He's talking about real captives, people who are captive of real systems and real issues and homelessness and orphans and, you know, like that's what he wants to do. Um, and recovering the sight of, of the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Favor And so like Jesus himself, you fast forward and Jesus becomes the savior of all men. And he says that it's going, that, that we are, that he came to set the captives free. But then guess what? This is the craziest part of the story is he dies, he comes back alive and he he passes the mantle of the Holy Spirit to the church. So all of a sudden, who are we? We're the church. We are now, as they would say, Christians, or also can be considered little Christs. We are now, just like Moses was back then, he has to go and set the captives free, right? So this is my challenge to you, and I am somewhat fast-forwarding because of just time and stuff, but... We'll continue going through this, but as I pointed out some of these things that we have in America that have happened, I'm just trying to tell you that we have, we have people captive in our own city, in our own actual reality, not just in some long lost you know, country that we have no clue what's going on and we just hear stories and we send our $50 a month to try to help. I think that that's great but you actually have captives in this town and we're called to go and do something about it. Like more than just pray for them. Because guess what? They are crying out and God is hearing their cries. And you know what the, his answer to these people who don't know God, a lot of these people don't know God. They're crying out and what's happening is God's, as it says later on, he hears and he sees, and he knows, okay? And what is his answer to this problem? His answer is that he sends his church to go and help them. And because he could send a, an army group, he could send a Peace Corps, he could send whatever, and those people could save them and give them like food and all that kind of stuff, which actually physically we should be doing okay we should be feeding we should be clothing we should be getting people out of captivity in literal sense but why he sends the church to do it is because we can bring them life we can bring them the bread of life we can bring them the spirit that is the water to their souls thirst or they will thirst no more as he says because that is what we can bring to him. That's why he calls out the church. That's why it's not good enough for us to just give money to some people to do it. There are a lot of humanitarian programs out there that say that they're Christian. And I don't want to like rank on any of them. I'm not even going to say a name. But there are a lot of ones that say that they're Christian. And I believe that they are Christian to some degree because, um, you know, they, they are founded originally on Christian beliefs. But they go out and they go and do humanitarian things, but ultimately they never share Jesus with any of them. And so we really have to be um, proactive on this because this is what the Bible says. <laughs> you know, like I can't, I can't be any, it, like the Bible can't be any more clear than it is, uh, you know, on this specific thing, what we're supposed to be doing. Um, so it says that uh, towards the end, it says, um, like I was saying, God heard their groaning. God remembered this covenant with Abraham. Okay, so God remembered their covenant. Uh, one, God always remembers us and his promises to us, uh, his promises to us personally. He will go the extra mile to fulfill his will. This is something that I wanted to point out too. It's like, this is true. When we're crying out, 
when those people, like I was saying, marginalized other people who are dealing with issues and all that stuff, when they're crying out, um, God wants to come and save them. He has every desire for all men to be saved. Every desire. And so if God's will is for them to be saved and they're crying out. Now, don't get me wrong. There are people that don't cry out. So I'm not saying everybody gets saved, okay? You can really mess that up with what I'm saying right now. Not everybody's going to be saved, and it's sad. But I, I will tell you, the people who are not going to be saved are the ones that never feel like they ever needed to cry out, or they never cried out to God. The ones that do cry out to God, God wants to save them. He wants them to get the rescue that they are begging for, okay? And now I'm not saying, maybe we fail. I, you know, I don't know this. This is hard. Maybe us Christians, we decide we just really like to drive in our snow and, uh, you know, whatever. Nothing you did today was bad, just so you know. I think you're awesome. But, like, we, maybe we just want to go to our movies and do whatever we want to do and not go and save anybody, okay? And maybe we fail and there's a lot of people that cried out that never get saved. I don't know this, but what it looks like to me is in the Bible, if people are willing and able and they actually cry out and they yell out, God wants to save them and God wants to send people to save them. And so one thing that I say that is very important I see in the Bible is that God always remembers us and remembers them just like he remembered Israel. And he, pr and he remembers the promises that he's given us. So us Christians, we know the promises. So I know that a lot of us have family members that, you know, walk away from the Lord and they just destroy their lives. And there are some of them where they, and I don't know, maybe some of you guys are these people. I've done this. I, I definitely had four or five years of really bad living my life. And I got to a point where I had to go, God, I really need you, but I don't even know how to come to you. And it was just a, a guttural cry of, God, I need you. And um, I could remember the promises. So that's another thing. He always remembers his promises, just like the, he remembered their covenant. And then he will go the extra mile to fulfill his will. This is something I wanted to really point out too, is that it's impossible for God to fail his will right? So if he promises something, that's his will. If he promises it, that's his will. So that's something we can always rely on. Uh, number two on this same, uh, this same God remember their covenant, it says, all right, I wrote, God's dedication to setting the captives free goes beyond the story of Israel's deliverance goes all the way to the cross and then passed on to the church, like I said, and you and me are called to be like Moses. I really skipped ahead on myself. Um, and then it says God saw the people of Israel, and it says God knew. So one thing I wanted to point out is that our prayers matter, okay, which I said in the beginning, but this is an important thing to say again. Our prayers matter, and so just like the cries of those people that are hurting and everything, our prayers matter, so we need to pray because God sees, God hears, God knows because of our prayers. Well, he knows because he's all-powerful, but there is a transaction that happens. It's very clear in the Bible that there is prayers that happen before a lot of things happen. So God hears prayers and then the cries of those unable to recognize who they are crying to, those matter as well, like I said. God also knew even before they cried. So that's another thing is that everything that they're dealing with, God has always known about this. And I love, I love that it says that, God's, that God knew because it doesn't say... It doesn't say God remembered. Uh, I could kind of like replace this and say, um, they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard, because it's a, it's a past tense thing. 
They're groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. When you think when God knew, it's very clear that God knew before all of that stuff happened. But it's so important that all the rest of it's there. Okay? And that's why I'm pointing out these things. Um, and then it says, God knows what we need, the cries, and the cries are enough. That's another thing, too, is that sometimes, and I don't know about you guys, I just want to apply this to you now, okay? Sometimes we don't know what to say to God. I don't know if you guys have been there, but I don't know what to say to God. I actually had my son Elijah um, ask me something the other day. Um, and I actually, let's see here, I led Isaiah to the Lord. I think my wife led Elijah to the Lord. We kind of have like a, a thing going. Who can, who can lead the most kids to the Lord? That's why I keep on having kids, because I want to win. Um, no, I'm just joking. Um, and yes, I've figured out how that happens. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the thing is, is uh, I think I, I didn't lead Elijah to the Lord, so I don't know exactly how that happened. I think my, it was my wife, and they were out doing something, and, got a, and, and, and Elijah asked and went through the prayer and did all that kind of stuff. But Elijah asked me a question that not too long ago, and the question, um, I don't remember the exact words, but basically he was asking, it's like, um, how do I know what to say to God when I pray to him? And how do I know, yeah, what to say to God, and then how do I know the right words that's going to save me? That's what it was, something like that. Okay, so here's, there's something really interesting about that because I actually think that some of us drink that Kool-Aid too, where we actually think that they're very clear, specific words we have to say to be saved. But that, there isn't like a specific, there's not specific words that you have to pray. That's not how it works. God, he wants you to realize your sin, realize your need for a savior and basically ask for forgiveness, but it can be said in many ways. But I think there's a lot of people that actually um, are always looking, they're coming to church to find what is that quick fix or what is that thing I can say to try to save, to, to be saved. And I think that that's something that, um, as I was saying before, with the cries of the people, of the marginalized and the, 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 those that are in captivity, those people don't even know who they're crying to. But God hears them. And so if it's the same way, you guys know who you're talking to. God's going to hear what you have to say. Uh, another thing, too, is God knows what we need. The cries are enough. Like I said, we don't have to have all the answers to pray for them. Coming to him in humility is what he's really asking for. Um, those suffering don't know what to say and how to pray, but God hears them and knows their problems. That's what this, I feel like this whole thing encompasses. Um, and then I have one last thing that I wrote down. The church is called to be the Moses of the world. Just like him, we are not the hero in the story, but God is. God, knowing just what is needed at all times, still called out the church to love, feed, clothe, and set free those who are in need of such things. In the process, filled with the Spirit, they will hear and see the gospel and will also get the chance to receive the gift of grace through Jesus and follow God to help others in captivity. So that's something I think that this, this whole section of Scripture kind of teaches us. It teaches us that we are called to so much more like, we're, we're actually called to really do something, you know? And um, that these people are crying for help, and the answer to those problems, you're not the hero, okay? You're not the savior, but the answer to the problem is the people that God called to go and minister to them, to go get them out of captivity. And I believe that the Bible absolutely teaches that the church is where those ministries are, are out. There's a lot of parachurch ministries out there, like I said, that are, I was talking about some that don't share the, about the gospel. There are a lot of them that do share about the gospel. But it does 
it is very clear in, in the New Testament that the church is where ministry starts. And so we have an opportunity as a church, and uh, I'm actually the missions pastor at the church as well, so we have chances and opportunities for us to be do these such things and be launched from our church to go and minister to those that are having problems and, uh, and you know, set the captives free, literally and, of course, spiritually as well. And so um, as we pray and we end, um, I just want you to, like, kind of let that sink in a little bit and walk away from this praying that you make it home safely first, okay? And then pray that, um, that God would send you out and go do something for him, whether that is the next time you drive by a homeless person, you actually get to know the person. I really don't think we should stop trying. There's going to be times where it doesn't work, but I think we should absolutely continue to try. Um, there's, a, there's another stat that I thought was really, really challenging. I was listening to a podcast, and the podcast was um, about foster care. And uh, I don't foster. I have so many kids of my own, I can't handle any more. But maybe we will one day. But I'm at my max at this point, OK? <clears throat> and maybe we will. And there's a reason why I'm listening to it, because I'm really praying about what we can do about this, not just personally as a family, but as a church. We have a really great ministry of people that go to our church that do um, encourage foster care. And I think there's even. There's even a couple here that has foster child, and there's, there's, there's some really cool things that's happening already. But one thing, a stat that's really, really hard to swallow is that the podcast, by the way, was more geared towards, I was just really curious to hear what this, this guy was going to say, because he's in charge of a big fostering um, ministry, and he's a Christian, right, because it's a ministry. I said that. So he... Um, the question was, and what he was attacking that day, is should gay couples be able to foster? Now, he believes very clearly in the Bible that the Bible teaches that, that homosexuality is not a, a, an actual uh, way of life, a, a way of a Christian life, okay? He believes that they shouldn't get married, all the standard stuff that we believe here at the church too, okay? But one of the things that he had a hard time with that he, as he was trying to answer it, and I thought this was very interesting, is that he could always go back to the one of the hardest stats there is, which the stat is that there's not enough heterosexual couples to actually foster the needed kids that there are, first of all, okay? Let alone Christian ones. So he's having people come in, and, and his first, when he first started this thing, he started it because he wanted to get foster children into Christian homes. That's why he actually started this ministry. And so um, he started this like 10 years ago, and he learned with only just a few years that eventually he ran out of families that were willing to, the Christian families that were willing to foster and now he's having to, this was before the whole, you know, gay marriage thing that happened and all that kind of stuff, before he, he, um, he had very strict rules of, he couldn't have a strict rule of being, they can only be Christian, that can't be an actual rule, it was against whatever, but he did have, um, they had to be married, you know, he had some specific rules, and but eventually it got to the point where he is now having to start receiving, like he doesn't want, they say that if a foster child actually ages out of the system, it's like 80% chance that they're gonna go to jail and get into drugs or something like that, okay? So like he's thinking, I love these kids so much. And there's only 10% of Christian families willing to foster. There's only 10%. And so now I have 90% of these kids that are either going to go to jail or have, you know, go to, you know, drug addictions or whatever it is, okay? 
or I give them a family that's loving that doesn't know Jesus because I don't really have a choice, you know? So then he started making some exceptions of like his, his um, conviction because he couldn't technically, I think there was some kind of rule or whatever in whatever state he was in that he couldn't actually say you had to be Christian because it's some kind of government um, thing. And there might, I don't know all the details of that. But anyway, the point is, is this conversation started getting to um, homosexual couples, okay? And, and really the point is, is that he actually, even though he did not want to at all. He, he just absolutely, biblically could not get, be okay with letting a homosexual family take a kid, okay? He was looking at the hard stats of going, there's a really good chance this person's going to die of drugs or go to jail, and I've got to make a decision. My point is, is not that I'm okay with any of that and that you should be okay with it and that you should write a hate mail to me or whatever. What my point is, is that fostering is something we can do, okay? That's something you can do practically. Um, And there's all kinds of other things we can do, but one of the things that we need to realize is that there's, there, we actually do need to step up and do some of these ministries, because if we don't do it, nobody else is doing it. And if they're doing it, they're not doing it as good as God is, and God has called you to do it. That's the answer. The answer to the problems is, to him, was, let me save the world And as the church grows, the church goes out and shares my love to people. That is the story. And so now we need to actually believe it and live it out. So um, I don't know if you're challenged today or if I just annoyed you. But we're going to pray anyway. And hopefully that annoying thing will go away and you guys just be challenged. Here we go. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you. God, I just thank you, Lord, for your word and um, any... Any annoying things that I did, Lord, please take that away, God. And I do pray, Lord, that we will walk away challenged, but challenged in the greatest way, Lord, where we, um, it's, it's a challenge where it's like flexing, it's like, like building up our muscles and, and it hurts, but no pain, no gain kind of thing, Lord. And I just pray, God, that we'll walk away um, with a, a, um, a plan in mind to... Um, Go and step out and love on those that are not loved on, basically. And those that are crying out for help that might not know you and they're still crying out for help. They're saying, if there's a God out there, please come to my rescue. And he has called us to do something about that. And so I pray, Lord, give us practical um, wisdom on how we can do that from Calvary Chapel, Tri-Cities specifically. We love you, Lord. Amen. God bless you.